So without further ado, I would like to introduce our speaker for today, David Crowley. Uh, Dave uh, is a professor emeritus from the Department of Environmental Sciences at UC Riverside. I know for the California growers, many of you know David. He um, was in the department for 26 years. I was shocked to find out that he's been retired for six years. I can't believe that. This morning I found that out. And in, in that, he did research on soil health, salinity, and plant and soil interactions. And uh, during his tenure at, in California, he um, had quite a few grants that was funded by the California Avocado Commission. And sort of like the final project he did was looking at trying to correlate overall tree health, <clears throat> nutritional status, and salinity to yield because that's the bottom line. And that resulted in the um, decision, um, decision, I can't remember what the name of it, Dave, you'll have to, but he's gonna talk about the outcome of all that research that was funded by the California Avocado Commission um, at the end of his presentation. So with that, I'll stop sharing Dave and you can start sharing your screen. <clears throat> All right, well, good morning. It's uh, good to be back as my first Zoom presentation. So um, hopefully it'll run pretty smoothly here. As Mary Lou mentioned, it's been six years since I retired and um, that's, it seems hard to believe. One of the things that I enjoyed most while I was at UCR was working with the avocado growers and getting out to the field and uh, seeing plants in, in, uh, in, in growth and you know, looking at the real world situation of trying to produce avocado and put it all together. Uh, while I was there at, at Riverside, I worked on uh, initially zinc nutrition of avocado uh, that started almost after the first month I got there when Lynn Francis recruited me to work on a project looking at zinc nutrition, which actually turned out to be more of a problem with iron than zinc, so uh, a first learning experience. And then later on, I did work on salinity issues and trying to screen some of the rootstocks. And there's a lot of interesting work there. And then <clears throat> lastly, it was all leading towards the uh, development of decision support tools, um, looking at the different nutritional problems and trying to see what their actual effects are on tree yields. And that project uh, that ended with the development of decision support tools that were initially uh, picked up by the California Avocado Commission, and then the university gave the license to that to Sure Harvest. And then um, I'm not sure exactly what happened at that point, but uh, I was I had left at that time, and um, I think it needed better marketing. So those tools kind of disappeared from access. And uh, last year, um, Eddie Grangetto asked if uh, I could revise those or re re bring them back to life, and uh, we since started a business to look at uh, how we can help avocado growers in determining the most limiting elements. So we'll be looking at a variety of things today. And, and avocado is really one of the most uh, challenging crops to look at nutritionally. Uh, it's all clonal material, which helps, but uh, at the same time, uh, you have uh, so many different nutrients that are interacting and uh, this, this complicates issues. And you'll see that, uh, especially when you have alternate bearing, it's hard to come up with a, an actual concentration, but we were able to solve that. And uh, we had a great team at that time with uh, Carol Lovett and her uh, data set that she provided and Salvatore Campisi, postdoc from uh, Italy who applied some new mathematical methods. And at the end, we developed uh, polynomial equations that can describe the yield response uh, that is associated with different levels of nutrients in the plant. And I think you'll, you'll be surprised, and, and I, I'm really uh, hoping that uh, many of you will, will take advantage of these tools and uh, be able to see an increase in your yields. Now, some of this is still empirical in that uh, we'll find elements that are present at low concentrations, but someone needs to go out and actually uh, apply these elements and bring them up and see what their effects are on yields. Sometimes you might suspect uh, that 
uh, it, it's due to some other reason and it's just correlated with yield, not necessarily cause and effect. But um, the evidence is pretty convincing that various nutrients do affect yield. Now, uh, what makes this urgent is the uh, price of fertilizer. I got this out of the, off the internet uh, a couple of weeks ago. And this red line at the top up here, let's see if I can get my pointer, uh, shows the prices for uh, this year. And we're getting up to $1,000 a ton for urea. Uh, that's triple the price that we had back in 2020. And, and the five-year average here, you can see, has is, is always been around 350 a ton. This is, I don't know where it's going from here, but with the war in Ukraine and uh, the energy prices uh, going up, natural gas involved in uh, uh, fabricating uh, nitrogen fertilizers, it's become very expensive. So it means what we need to reevaluate, how much nitrogen do we really need? This is the most managed nutrient. How much do we really need? Can we get by with less? And what is our nitrogen use efficiency? And so we'll try and address this question and then I'll turn to the other elements. Now the history on avocado uh, fertilizer research goes back a long ways and proudly uh, from the University of California, even before it was uh, the uh, campus of UC in Riverside, it was the Citrus Experiment Station. And that earliest work was in yearbook 18, uh, 1933. And at that time, the only way to fertilize was with the addition of manure to soils. And uh, that was because chemical fertilizers weren't really developed and commercially until uh, 1950s, 19, late 1940s and 50s. And we see uh, work coming out here in 1952, the year I was born, uh, nutrient composition and seasonal losses of avocado trees. And this was uh, with uh, researchers again at UC Riverside. So a lot of history on uh, avocado uh, fertilizer uh, research at UC. Now there are, uh, we know all plants require uh, actually some 17 elements. Uh, we have two here that are chloride and sodium. Uh, these are, many of these are required in extremely small amounts and we, we monitor these primarily for their toxicity effects on plants, uh, chloride being much more serious. But by far the most managed or macronutrient is nitrogen, which occurs in plants at 2.2 to 2.6% uh, concentration. And this is across the board for a wide variety of plants and you'll find different ranges, um, but it generally center around these values. Now, one of the reasons for this is because nitrogen is so uh, dynamic in soils, it's, it's a supplied as either uh, ammonia or nitrate, and ammonia converts to nitrate. Nitrate is subject to denitrification, gas loss every time it rains or you irrigate, and it's subject to leaching, which is a major loss. And in California today, uh, many of our groundwater wells are now exceeding the concentrations allowed for nitrate. So uh, this one is being monitored and increasingly regulated. And we try and aim for a high nitrogen use efficiency, getting most of the fertilizer we apply into the plant. But even still, uh, we will have some losses to the irrigation uh, water uh, with leaching. Now, beyond nitrogen, the other macronutrients that are required in percent amounts are phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, calcium, and magnesium. And these are stored in the soil, um, much better stored in a clay soil than in a sandy soil. And once you start getting into really sandy soils and it's more of a hydroponic situation, but these are mineral forms that are relatively stable in the soils and they have to be mobilized by the plant root and accessed uh, through uh, root interception or diffusion that uh, leads to the uptake of these elements. So uh, these are on the exchange complex uh, and they're uh, again guided primarily by leaf analysis that tells us when we have a deficiency and when we might want to apply these fertilizers. But typically, these are not applied every single year. The micronutrients, these are required only in parts per million. And we have uh, traditional problems with zinc and iron deficiencies in uh, California avocado groves. Manganese is, um, is taken up in relatively large amounts as compared to zinc and iron, but um, it's an interesting element in that it seems to have a very broad range of uh, uh, 
acceptability as far as leaf tissue analysis. Now, copper and boron, on the other hand, are required in very, very small amounts. And uh, for copper, for example, uh, we have uh, five to 15 parts per million. And in avocado, you'll see that centers right at about eight parts per million as optimal. And so just a few parts per million of copper can take you over the top. And the same thing with boron. So you have to be very careful with these trace elements not to get into excessive quantities. The simplest method to uh, look at what you might need is based on the, um, the actual carryoff of the element. Uh, after you harvest the crop, your, all the fruit is, contains uh, nitrogen, all the different elements, and this leaves the orchard. We have a lot of nitrogen and also cycles through to produce flowers and leaves, and, and we have leaf drop and flower drop, bloom drop every year. And this goes down to the, forest, the grove floor and undergoes decomposition and gets taken up again uh, through efficient uh, root systems and mycorrhizal networks. So a lot of this internal cycling of nitrogen uh, in the tree itself, and then we have the, uh, the, the ecological component where you're looking at what's stored in the soil and how that's mobilized by microbial activity and decomposition and its uptake, which is relatively very efficient. If you look at how weeds do, uh, they mostly don't get fertilized and that's due to the fact that all these elements are recycling in the soil. Now looking at a, a 6,000 pound crop, you can see 16 pounds is, is, we can put in here any different value. And this tool is available on the Avocado Source website. And you put in your expected harvest, uh, 10,000, 16,000, whatever it is, 10,000 pounds is roughly about 30 pounds of nitrogen that's required. <clears throat> now, you can see some of the other elements here, phosphorus, about a third of that. And then uh, sulfur is actually required almost in the same amount as nitrogen. And uh, then we have uh, calcium, magnesium, three pounds, six pounds. Again, there's a lot of calcium. Our soils are, tend to be uh, and if you have a calcareous soil, uh, it can be 2% of calcium. So there's tons of calcium, but a lot of it is insoluble. And so uh, we have to look at the carry off, but resupplying it in an available form. Potassium is the element that's required in the, uh, the highest amount. It's actual 40 pounds of potassium or 48 pounds of uh, K2O. And uh, this one is uh, supplied typically every few years. And given that it's required in higher amounts, roughly three times what's required for nitrogen, uh, it, it's actually one of our major expenses in producing avocados. Now I'll, I'll uh, share with you data that will show that uh, there's been a lot of excitement about using potassium, but perhaps a little bit too much, uh, we'd see a trend towards over-application of potassium. And I'll give you the case for that, uh, that argument. Another very useful tool, if you go to the avocadosource.com, is to look at uh, how you can um, supply these elements. You put in using the scroll bar right here, the type of fertilizer that you uh, are considering, the ones that are, have the best price. And it will give you the fertilizer formula and the pounds after you push the calculate button. And uh, say you're using a mixed fertilizer like the potassium uh, thiosulfate. If you want to supply potassium and sulfur, then you can look at sulfur as the second nutrient and potassium is a primary nutrient, and then look at the price of these and determine which elements are, or which fertilizer materials are gonna be the most uh, affordable and best use. But you'll also see that there's some other uh, tools that are provided here, looking at soil levels, um, nutrient interaction chart, uh, a variety of tools that are useful. Now, beyond that, uh, in more recent years, so we've had the CDFA, the California Department of Food and Agriculture has come up with guidelines for uh, all the major crops in California. And it's interesting to go to this website and I've given you a button up here. When you have the presentation, you can push this button or you can go up here and enter in this, uh, this word, uh, this string phrase up here and it'll take you to that website. And all these little boxes are interactive. So if you push uh, nitrogen and soil test, it'll give you uh, the results of what you expect when you have sufficient levels of nitrogen, uh, leaf analysis and interpretations. I'll just take a moment here and take you to that page. I think I, hopefully it'll work here. Uh, maybe I, I might have 
I might have to go back here. Anyway, uh, let's take it to the next thing here. If we look at soil applied nitrogen, um, it'll tell you here, first of all, your, your soil test, and you can look at the application rates and guidance on what time of the year that it should be applied. Typically, you're applying nitrogen and all these fertilizers really uh, are best taken up right after early root growth. So a couple of weeks after the leaves flush in the springtime, root growth begins, and then you have uh, the most receptive conditions for uptake of, of nutrients. And this is especially true with the, the micro elements. Uh, if you're supplying chelated forms and so on, uh, more than well, several times I had growers ask about how to solve an iron deficiency. And, and it was really, uh, they would, I'd recommend the chelate EDDHA. And a couple of weeks later, they'd call me and say, nothing's happening and say, wait, you know, if your leaves haven't uh, budded out yet. Uh, you're, you don't have uh, root growth. And then they'd call again another couple of weeks to say it's working. So uh, you really need to time your fertilizers, especially um, the trace elements for uptake by the roots to get the most effective use. Otherwise they tend to uh, precipitate out into the soil. Now, one of the things that uh, is surprising here in this recommendation um, is that we need um, early studies suggested uh, that we needed a couple pounds of N per tree, which corresponds to to 290 pounds, 145 to 290 pounds per acre. And I just showed you from the nutrient removal calculator that avocado needs about uh, 30 pounds for uh, a 10,000 pound crop. <clears throat> this is an extremely low nitrogen use efficiency. Typically you want to have, uh, well, across all crops, nitrogen use efficiency is about 30%, 33%. So meaning about a third of what you supply as fertilizer is going into the crop and the rest is going off to denitrification or, or leaching. So uh, we aim for 75 is, is, is possible in, in the laboratory. 50% is what you aim for and 30% is what most crops get. But if we're looking at 290 pounds versus 30 pounds that's required by the crop, that's, that's uh, less than 10%. And, that 30 pounds itself is actually uh, <clears throat> supplied uh, probably by air pollution and, and, and water pollution. If you have just a few parts per million of uh, nitrate, 10 parts per million of nitrate nitrogen in your irrigation water, which is common in, in many wells, that's the, the uh, limit, that's maximum contaminant level, but many of our wells go past that. And uh, that's already supplying 15 to 20 pounds of nitrogen uh, to the crop just through the irrigation water that you're applying. So out of that 30 pounds, half of it is already coming from your water. And in Southern California with uh, atmospheric pollution and dry deposition of nitrogen, uh, you get as much as 50 pounds of nitrogen in the LA area and typically 10 to 15 across uh, large areas of Southern California and Central Valley. So uh, we almost, According to that, we really don't need to do much fertilization at all. So this has been one of the things in putting this talk together um, has been looking at trying to reconcile these very high rates of nitrogen that are applied versus uh, what's required for the crop. Let's see. I can't seem to get this to go forward. Here we go. Now, <clears throat> nitrogen deficiency, uh, you probably are not going to see this very often, but uh, nitrogen deficiency starts when you have levels of about 1.6 to 1.9 uh, parts or percent in the foliage. And it'll show up as a yellowing of the foliage, typically on the older leaves. And that's because nitrogen is mobile in the plant. Uh, it's taken up by the roots stored in the trunk and the branches in the stems and then it moves out to the leaves, it moves uh, through the plant to the flowers. Uh, at the end of the year, it's exported out of the leaves and uh, is back into the tree again. So there's a large internal reservoir of nitrogen that the tree draws on. And you can supply nitrogen, um, but it, it, its actual assimilation into the plant tissues depends on the creation of amino acids in the roots, the assimilation into the uh, metabolic pathways and, and storage in the tree. So uh, trees will take up a little bit beyond what they need. That's the luxury consumption point. But 
once they hit a threshold, there's not really anything driving the uptake of nitrogen. And uh, anything that you're applying over those required amounts is, is either luxury consumption or it doesn't go into the tree at all. It's, it's uh, lost from the system. I'm having difficulty changing it. Let me try it down here. Now, some of the most uh, uh, relevant work that has really tried to fine tune the amounts of nitrogen that we require for uh, production of avocado it's done by uh, Jaime Salvo in uh, Carol Lovett's group. And they've carried out a number of studies over time trying to figure out the application time uh, that's optimal and number of times that you apply it and uh, the absolute quantities. Now, this, this study uh, is from 2016, and it's, uh, I think, the capstone of where we are at this point, showing uh, the actual requirements for nitrogen may be much lower than what many growers are applying, certainly less than the 290 pounds. In this study, they looked at uh, uh, these five different application periods, starting in January, April, July, August, and November. And April is when the root growth begins, and this is a critical time. July and August, we're looking at fruit fill. This helps to satisfy the floral, uh, the bud, uh, the bloom development. And so the idea of the strategy here is to apply it several times and of course, the advantage of applying it several times is that uh, you maintain uh, a lower level that's available for the roots, but not so subject to being leached out. If you apply everything all at once and you have a big rainstorm or you decide to leach your soil, uh, all your nitrogen is, is, is flushed below the root zone and uh, it's lost from the system. So applying nitrogen frequently is, uh, is an advantage and also even uh, using uh, fertigation is perhaps the best method of all for applying nitrogen. Now, in, in this study, uh, they took 125 pounds and distributed it over five application times. Then we have a second one where a double amount was applied in, in April, 50 pounds, and then the remaining amount was adjusted downward, so we still had the same total. And there were a variety of other combinations here in August, November, and April, looking at what times might be most effective. And then we have treatment eight here, which actually used a smaller amount, only 20 pounds supplied in July and August for a total of 40 pounds for the annual. Now, uh, this is the results from that study in, in terms of the four year cumulative yield. And the two that I highlight here are this uh, 2X in April, this was the highest yield and that was uh, 249 kilos per tree over the, the entire four year period. You can see there's very little difference. And in fact, um, the statistical difference here, the lowest one is here uh, with 208 pounds. And that was applying it twice in April and once in November. Probably November was, was not so necessary, but they missed something here in the summer. Now look at this value at the bottom, applying only 40 pounds and that's in two applications during the middle of the summer, they got 241, which is uh, the same statistically as what they got with the other, uh, their best treatment dividing it over two uh, X in April. And you can see um, that they had the highest amount of large fruit as well, right here by applying this very small amount, 40 pounds versus 125. Now, are they just coasting? This is a four-year study. Uh, what's happening to the internal nitrogen stored in the tree? Well, this is revealed by the leaf nitrogen concentrations. And you can see these are right in the middle of that range that I showed you earlier um, to about two and a half percent. And uh, here we have the, these two of the best treatments, 2.32, 125 pounds was applied. Here we had 40 pounds applied and we have 2.28. So no difference. It means that as we found with other crops and, and through many observations, avocado takes up what it needs to maintain a certain internal concentration. And then after that, it's satisfied. So all the other fertilizer that was applied uh, was, um, was lost from the system and was probably money not well spent. So it seems to me that uh, if there's a very high price that's uh, occurring right now for nitrogen, uh, many of you could probably reevaluate your program and think about applying lesser amounts at the right time of the year. And uh, it appears, um, interestingly enough, 
I mean, all these values, why did we, if we don't see differences in leaf concentrations, uh, what's special about July and August? And I think what we're seeing during this period is the fill of fruit and all this nitrogen is coming out of the trunk and the wood and it's being drawn, but it, it has to be exported into the fruit and applying nitrogen at that particular time of the year uh, through the soil and then it's absorbed by the roots, just uh, has it there in a little bit more ready form, which is able to support a higher production level. So with nitrogen, it's all about timing. And I think uh, with proper timing and uh, placement of the fertilizer, you can uh, greatly reduce. We certainly don't need 290 pounds from 40 pounds uh, works fine. So this is, uh, this is, I think, very valuable information that uh, the study has provided. <clears throat> now, uh, other uh, researchers that looked at um, nitrogen and, and other elements uh, across the, the world, uh, most of this is with, uh, with Hass avocados. So being clonal, it, you would think that it would have the same nutrient requirements, but uh, we see different values that have been accepted. And in uh, New Zealand, they, they like from 2.5 to 2.9 as their target range. Australia, 2.2. Uh, deficiency levels, we see uh, 1.6, um, pretty much agreed upon. And the avocado book range up to 2.8. And there's a general uh, understanding that over three is an excess. And even back in the 1950s, we had some of the earliest data showing the typical uh, curve where you have deficiencies, of peak amounts, and then uh, excess above uh, 3%, you start losing crop. So uh, these values have been well derived for nitrogen, but what about these other elements? We see very large variations here in New Zealand. They, they require in the leaf tissue 0.16 uh, to 0.22, where Australia says 0.08. And so everybody is trying to target these different values. And we sulfur here, 0.3 to 0.4. Uh, others calling it not deficient until it's 0.05. And then 0.2 to 0.6. So we're honing in on it, but we haven't quite figured out exactly the re yield relationships that are uh, associated with these different levels of nutrients. Now, in this uh, study, which was done by John Dixon, uh, Jonathan Dixon, he uh, reports the yield class. They take, they had several thousand observations and they looked at uh, the yield class with increasing yields going in this direction. And what were the nutrient levels in the tree uh, at each of these different uh, yield classes? And this is similar to the approach that we used with the uh, decision support tools. And across here, you can see with uh, nitrogen, it's, it's relatively flat, and the more you have higher yield classes, it just gets noisier and noisier, but there's no statistical difference between any of these levels. On phosphorus, we see low levels of phosphorus are associated with the highest yields, and it's pretty tight, but then it curves down and it kind of curves up again. So it's an unusual curve. It's not a straight uh, arc like you would see on a classic nutrient uh, range, but it does follow a polynomial equation, which could be modeled. Now here on potassium, it's very clear that the highest yield classes have the lowest levels of potassium. And remember, uh, we need some 48 pounds of potassium for 10,000 pound crop. As you go up here in yield class, you can see that the percent uh, potassium in here starts uh, going down, not, not all that much, but from 1.1 down to 1.05. And we're already seeing yield reductions and greater variability. Uh, calcium, you see the opposite of potassium. You see with calcium and magnesium, both of these have uh, higher levels in the leaf tissue that are associated with the high yield classes. And same thing here for sulfur. You see as sulfur goes up in the leaf tissue that we have more and more uh, higher yield class. So this is similar to what we did in our work, and you'll be seeing a few of these charts. This is the, the first um, of uh, several. This is the one for nitrogen. And this is our results in which we looked at the yield in terms of kilograms per tree. We, we looked at some, uh, well, in the study itself, we had some 3,000 trees across, or 3,000 observations across the transect of uh, Southern California. And this is where most of the trees are in these blue boxes. And this is the mean right here, the red line. You see it's essentially flat all the way from 1.4 on up to 3.72.
Now, uh, these are outliers. These are trees that are producing up here up to 300 kilograms per tree. But we, we set these categories here of uh, zero to 10. Going across here is the dark purple, uh, 10 to 30 uh, kilograms per tree in the blue. Uh, this brownish color is uh, uh, 30 to 50. And then anything that's producing over uh, 50 kilograms per tree uh, or high 100, up to 100 kilograms of fruit uh, is right here in the yellow. So <clears throat> what we do see is that as you start going towards very high levels of nitrogen hitting over here 3.72%, we have uh, lost uh, a number of high yielding trees and that, uh, that class has now been depleted. So um, we have uh, larger numbers of these intermediate low uh, producing trees it seems that we've, we've depleted this class and we're pushing trees down here and we're seeing this. But all these down here that are in this dark purple are trees that are in an alternate bearing mode. And so this is, uh, these are ones that will not always be down here. They'll bounce up next year uh, into this category. But what we'd like to see is having most of our trees up here in the brown and of course build this yellow group, the high yielding group as much as possible. Now, uh, at this point, I, I want to just give a quick reminder about the importance of uh, Liebig's law, the minimum, and uh, also to remind that it, it's not just the minimum, uh, it's also could be an excess. If something affects the yield, uh, whatever affects the yield the most is going to be the element that you have to deal with. Uh, here we have uh, the most limiting element is, is P205. You see deficiencies of sulfur and uh, nitrogen and so on. But as long as you have this deficiency of P2O5, adding more nitrogen is not going to take care of the problem and give you yield, the amount of yield indicated by the volume of water. And the same thing applies. If, if you have a, a chloride toxicity and it's suppressing yields, uh, applying more phosphorus, applying more calcium, um, there might be some small effects, but for the most part, it, your yield is going to be determined by the factor that's most constraining, that's most limiting on your, your uh, yield and fruit production. So we need to rank these elements. And this is one of the challenges is when we might have multiple deficiencies going on simultaneously, uh, trying to separate out these, these possible interactions. So uh, the question that we took up with the decision support tool project was, can we model the relationships between avocado yield and the levels of the different elements. And uh, what are the optimum levels that are associated with achieving the highest possible yields? And are there nutrient interactions? And then uh, we didn't get into this in addressing this, but I think this is, remains an important question. Uh, are there optimal times for applying uh, these different fertilizers and uh, getting them into the plant and achieving environmental safety as well? Now, just to give you an idea of the areas that we looked at, all the yellow dots here were groves that we included in our original decision support tools project. And uh, they included the transect pretty much of the industry. We had a dozen sites and we had some uh, 450 trees, 12 locations. We took data from individual trees, collected the fruit from those trees, and then um, kept track of them over time. And uh, with that, we were able to build up a data set of a couple thousand data points. And then uh, as we proceeded with the project, Carol Lovett volunteered her uh, data sets and we amassed everything into a gigantic data set and determined that, that they were all behaving similarly through statistical analysis. And uh, this enabled us to, uh, to study the effects of uh, all these nutrients. Now, some of the initial results were uh, published in an article from the Grove and also in the uh, Congress uh, uh, on management of uh, nutrients. Uh, that was, I think it was in Chile. And it shows the yield characteristics of uh, avocado trees. So here you can see at any time across some uh, 3000 uh, trees that we looked at, some 600 were down here producing uh, zero to 22, uh, pretty much uh, almost no fruit. So this, these are the ones that are in alternate bearing. And, and of these, probably only about a third of the trees in the study at any one time 
were not in alternate bearing mode. They could be pushed into it probably, but about a third of the trees had an uh, alternate bearing of less than 0.5. If it was greater than 0.5, then uh, they become, uh, it makes for a very noisy data set. So in some of our studies, we filtered these out to look at only the uh, ones that were not in an alternate, alternate bearing mode. In other cases, we looked at the entire data set to look at the yield class distributions. But uh, again, you'll see that um, as you look at the number of trees going up here, about 30% uh, were right in here and producing on average about 30 pounds per, uh, per acre, 35 kilos per, per tree. And then as you go the number of trees here, this is the number of trees and this is the actual fruit yield. You can see that um, the distance between here and here vertically, more than half your crop is produced by only about uh, a third of the trees. And once you get up to about this level, 350 pounds per tree, then you get to very small numbers. And there are outliers like this. We'd like to know what's happening here. But um, uh, these were excluded from the trial because they're, they're, uh, they're just a little bit too uh, variable for us and, and noisy. Now, looking at the potassium data, <clears throat> and this is across the, the entire data set, each of these trees is, or each of these dots is a data point for a particular tree at a particular potassium level. And here you can see the yields going up to some 300 kilograms per tree. And then um, you see the general shape of the data set down here on the bottom the yields, you can see for across all these down here at the bottom, these are ones that are in the alternate bearing mode on the off cycle. And so these are never going to be responsive to a nutrient once you're in that mode. But you also see sort of a double mode here. And in the middle, right at about 1%, it seems like the number of alternate bearing trees may be less. And the data set's been pushed up in this direction. So certainly there's a, an, a line here, an arc, if we fit the, the peak for the majority of the trees coming up here to about 150 kilos per tree, it's clear that at somewhere 0.9 to 1% is the optimum. And that's even true for the very highest yielding trees. Some of these do fine at lower levels of even 0 0.6, 0 0.7. But the vast majority of trees, we would really seek to bring the potassium levels up to about 0.8%. And you see the other aspect of it is, is that all these that are on this side going down have excess potassium. So going above, uh, say 1.2%, you've already lost half of your yield potential. So what we measure is the yield potential going across here, and then uh, we fit a curve to that, and then you can bring it down and see where, where that fits with the amount of nutrients that's in the plant. Now, what that tells us is that, unfortunately, many growers have been applying too much potassium. And so this is uh, a concern, uh, especially for such an expensive element. And here you can see the way that potassium affects this data set. This is the yield in kilograms per tree. And you can see at 0.98, this is the median yield right here. We're getting up to, um, let's see, I think that's about 60 kilograms per tree. So uh, we're... All right, so we were discussing uh, potassium and the optimal concentrations. And uh, this is very clear in showing here the uh, the yields that you can obtain at a, are highest at about 1%. And over here, you see the effects associated on the different yield classes. And uh, it's very clear, again, that the highest number of high yielding trees are uh, centered around this level about 0 0.88, 0 0.9 to about 1%. And that as you apply more and more potassium <coughs> out here with loss of the high yielding trees and high numbers of trees that are in this uh, non-bearing mode, suggesting that even alternate bearing may be becoming worse with the uh, increasing amounts of potassium that's been applied. So clearly um, it, it's, it's a shame that uh, growers are spending large amounts of money in some cases on applying potassium and uh, causing a yield excess. It, it, it hurts uh, because you, you're costing, uh, you're losing profit and you, it's costing a lot of money. So there are uh, very important indications here from not only our study, but from other studies that, like Dixon's 
indicate that we have to be very careful with the amount of potassium. And it may take a few years if you've over applied for that potassium to deplete because it's going to be on the exchange complex. Now, how about uh, where's the avocado industry across all the different sites that we looked at? Um, this shows the uh, yield potential in terms of the percent of the maximum centering right here for about 1%, 0 0.8, 0 0.9. And then you see the curve going down like this as you get up to 2.5% nitrogen and the curve drops over here. So anybody, all these are trees that were in our study. These have all been over fertilized. Uh, many of the growers are the optimum and they're hitting the mark right there at 1%, but it's not like a little bit more is helpful. Once you pass this line, it's a fairly steep drop off on the uh, yields that you're able to achieve uh, at these higher potassium concentrations, even going up to one and a half percent, you've lost some half of your yield potential. Now, um, I wish I could get rid of the bar here. This is uh, dealing now with phosphorus. And remember it had somewhat of a complicated curve. Uh, Dixon's data suggested that the lower amounts were actually associated with higher yields. And here we see the same thing. Uh, very few trees down here at 0.05, but even at 0.12, we see that uh, some 20% of our trees, 25% of our trees are in this high yielding category. And as you go up here to the highest levels that we saw, uh, you've diminished that uh, high yielding class by about 50% of what it was at this level down here at 0.12. And you can see the curve that comes along with it. So it starts out here and it clearly indicates that there's uh, a probability that people are over fertilizing with phosphorus. And we see the curve again dropping down here. What about calcium and magnesium? <clears throat> Remember these are ones that were required in higher amounts. And we saw the same thing here. Calcium, very dramatic effects. You can see the low uh, or the high yielding class here uh, doesn't really increase until we start getting up about 1.5% per, uh, of calcium. And that uh, getting up here to about 1.92%, we've now uh, achieved high yields uh, for about 35% of the trees in, this, in the system. And the number of low yielding and alternate bearing uh, trees in the off cycle have dropped tremendously. And the same effect here, you can see with uh, magnesium that ideally you should be up here at about 0.6 to 0.7% uh, magnesium in your crop if you want to be at the levels that are associated with the highest yields. And this tells us that there could be very good uh, possible uh, yield responses by increasing levels of calcium and magnesium in the, in the crop. Now, where's the industry poised right now? Uh, the red line here shows the number of trees and the blue line shows the fruit yields. Most growers, uh, the ones that we encountered in our study and Carol Lovett's database uh, are here at 1.5% calcium, which puts our fruit yields down here at about 100 uh, kilograms per tree as the maximum potential. It bringing it up to 2%, 2.2, we now are in this category, things are a bit noisier, but hitting 2.2%, you've almost doubled the yield potential. And only a few growers, maybe 10% of growers are hitting that amount uh, in, in uh, achieving this level with calcium. Magnesium, the same thing. We see our highest yields out here, 0.7. Most growers are poised back here at 0.5. So we're seeing a difference of about 30% in yield potential. And um, the many, very few growers, only those that are out on this side are getting into this maximum fruit yield. But again, with magnesium and all these elements going too high, your yields drop, start dropping off very sharply. So uh, it tells us that we're able to hone in on these uh, with statistical methods on these yield classes and identify the levels that are associated with the uh, optimum yields. Now, sulfur, many of the elements that we look at, many growers, and I've been doing this for the last couple of years now, have been uh, looking at uh, reports and applying the DST analysis tools. And I'd say maybe only about a third of growers, maybe less than that, are even analyzing for sulfur. And uh, this is one of the elements that's required almost in the same amount as nitrogen, but who really worries about applying sulfur? 
It's mostly applied along with potassium thiosulfate or as gypsum, but uh, many growers are uh, not deliberately thinking about sulfur. And here we see the red line. This is the median yield going across. And you see the industry average is somewhere about 0 0.33, 0 0.35. And down here, we're probably about 30, 35 kilograms per tree. As we go over here to the optimum, <clears throat> the highest level, we need 0.5%. So a 0.2% difference in, in sulfur associates with 70 kilograms per tree. So huge difference. This suggests a potential of doubling yields by increasing the sulfur content from 0.3 to 0.53. And uh, these, these lines are, are very clear. You can see the trend lines with yield class. These are convincing. It's not just a noisy data set. Uh, things are going up and then they're going down as you apply too much sulfur. So here we've identified an optimum. Now the trace elements, uh, I'll just briefly cover these, but uh, these are very common uh, symptoms that you see in, in groves, especially in high pH soils. And all the deficiencies look somewhat similar. Um, I've looked at trees for years and, and zinc and iron and manganese, uh, you can maybe distinguish or make a good guess, but most of them end up as either leaf modeling, like you see in this case, and uh, intervenal chlorosis, where the trace metals are not delivered out of the uh, veins, and then you can end up with yellowing. And uh, this is not due to a deficiency in the soil per se, because uh, you're only requiring a few grams for the entire tree, and yet the soil contains some 4% iron. So tons and tons of iron is just not available. Here you can see the, um, the reason for this is because all these elements have lowered solubility as you increase the pH. Zinc, manganese decreased by a hundred fold for every unit increase in pH. So one of the simplest methods to increase these elements is to lower the pH of the soil and um, <clears throat> that'll bring them into solubility. If not, then you need to have um, a chelate which will hold them in uh, a complex form that maintains the solubility set by the chelate itself. So instead of having this is in uh, molar concentrations. One micromole here, uh, you need to have uh, approximately this level in the tree. Iron almost always requires to have organic acids or to be supplied in a chelated form because it drops off a thousand fold for every unit increase in pH. So inherently, um, high pH soils are gonna create um, a micronutrient deficiency problem. If you have a low organic matter soil, you're not using uh, chelates. Now, <clears throat> many growers have been applying zinc for years, and some of the recommendations uh, early on were up to seven pounds uh, per tree. Uh, that was before we had an understanding that, that zinc is also a heavy metal and should never be applied in those amounts. It would be a, a toxic waste site if you applied seven pounds per tree. So um, not only that, it would be excessive. Fortunately, zinc uh, applied at those levels would eventually precipitate out as zinc oxides and various minerals. But in the meanwhile, uh, those uh, elements uh, do have an optimum just like every other element. And this is a very classic curve. Here you can see 20 parts per million is fine for growing a tree. You'll have a great canopy, everything's green. You won't see any deficiency until you start going down, say, well below 25 to, to 20, you'll start seeing uh, modeling and, and increasing deficiency effects. But clearly the peak here is at about 50 parts per million zinc. And there we're going from a yield potential. Uh, well, we have to adjust our yield potential. This has been one of the challenges in our study is that you see there's variation around the line, but we'll take it up here at 100%. And if we follow the line this way, you can see over here, you've lost about 30%. Worse than even a zinc deficiency is having too much zinc. And as soon as you start going up above 60, 70 parts per million up here to 80, and again, all these are real data points. Uh, you can see that you could completely suppress your yields. You could uh, eliminate all your fruit by going up here to 80 to 90 parts per million of zinc. So you have to be very careful with uh, applying these trace elements. Manganese, uh, we see a very clear relationship uh, of going up <clears throat> with an optimum somewhere about 100, uh, going up here to 200. 
And then the line kind of scatters. We see a trend line, but not too many trees actually uh, in our data set had these large excesses. So we see a very broad range over which uh, manganese is, uh, can be delivered and that there are definite effects of having manganese deficiencies down here. This is pretty convincing. If you get below 50 parts per million manganese, then you're, you're losing about half the yield potential. Now, manganese is complicated because its availability is uh, determined by the oxidation state of the soil. And if you have a, a wet uh, soil with a lot of organic matter, it's reduced, uh, then you end up making the manganese two form, which is highly soluble and, and more available to the plant. So part of this could just simply be that uh, well-watered trees tend to have uh, better manganese concentrations. And um, there may, this is one where it may not necessarily be a direct cause and effect. <clears throat> Now, what can you do to adjust the pH and uh, to supply sulfur? Uh, one of the great tools I think that uh, has come online uh, in, in the last decades or so is the use of a sulfur burner. And these are uh, relatively simple devices. Uh, they can be set up near an irrigation pond. You can collect the sulfurous acid. It's not sulfuric, it's sulfurous. So it has an intermediate pH. It's not gonna burn or, or uh, uh, be caustic like sulfuric acid. Uh, you apply elemental sulfur in a burner and uh, it smokes and smoke bubbles through a liquid and the liquid goes in, the sulfur goes into the liquid form and you can deliver that sulfurous acid to lower your pH and to supply higher amounts of sulfur to the crop. So this solves a couple of different uh, situations. Now, on top of this, we have chloride toxicity. And uh, even though chloride is required in very small amounts, the major problem is with excess. And this is typical at the end of the year, almost all groves. Anytime you have an EC of your irrigation water above one and uh, you have greater than 100 parts per million chloride, it's gonna be very difficult not to have leaf burn. And leaf burn is only the most visible symptom. The, the earlier symptom is actually uh, the decline in root growth. Uh, work in Israel has shown that the root growth stops uh, well, well, about the same time that tip burns start showing up, but you've already affected root growth. And with poor root growth, you're not going to be able to take up nutrients. So this is a very confounding uh, effect on plant nutrition. And uh, one of the staves in the uh, uh, Liebig's law, the minimum barrel that uh, we looked at with chloride excesses. Now, uh, the results suggest here that some chloride, and this might be also one of those situations where more uh, irrigation water uh, is associated with this chloride level, but you start seeing that as you go up here above 0.5 and here with 0.6, you're starting to go down. At 1.5, you've lost yield. And, and this is showing the yield class. You've lost essentially all of your high yielding trees as soon as you get above 1% uh, chloride in the tree. And even the effects here, we weren't, didn't have enough data here to resolve completely this effect, but you can see the highest number of, uh, of high yielding trees is right here at about 0.39. So uh, the curve, when we work this out, is as you start getting above 0.5% chloride, you start getting a drop off. And as it goes from 0.5 to 1% chloride, you're looking at the elimination of uh, your fruit uh, harvest. So getting chloride under control is, is essential for uh, getting the other elements uh, worked out as well. Now, this all seems like a lot of data. What can we put together? You have the information here. You could go uh, to our report at the Avocado, uh, California Avocado Commission. We've got the curves in there. I think we have equations. Um, that information, uh, you're welcome to go through it. And, and I hope that, uh, that this information is, is taken up and, and used, but uh, there, there's also, I've learned, it's not just coming up with the information, you have to market this as well. And Eddie Grangetto uh, has been very helpful as a, a business partner to, uh, uh, to open this up as a tool that can be made accessible to everybody. So in the meanwhile, until it becomes uh, in a different format, uh, we're offering this service now to apply the uh, decision support tools, the polynomial equations, and give you a ranking of how this affects your yield potentials. Now, here's a sample report. Uh, at the top here, uh, you give me your leaf tissue concentrations, and then uh, we'll run them through the 
uh, model. Uh, here's the target levels. These are the optimum levels that will give you 100% uh, yield potential for each of the elements. And then we rank them according to Liebig's law. And this is a pretty good situation. In this case, 84% yield potential is caused by copper and boron. We see magnesium is too low. Manganese, this one is probably low responsiveness, but typically this all looks pretty good. Over here, uh, yield potential on zinc. Uh, we see it's gone in site two, it's down to 25 parts per million, enough to give you a green canopy, no chlorosis. But you're now at 30%, you've lost 30% of your yield potential. And copper, 84, iron, 88, but everything's looking pretty good. Here's another uh, report. In this case, we have chloride excess. And you can see here the, the chloride 1.14, 1.18. Uh, the grower has lost in this case 56%. And over here, they've lost 64% of their yield potential because of chloride. If you're in this situation, what's the point of applying nitrogen and potassium? Uh, and in this case, he's actually got an excess of potassium as well. Uh, we see 1.62, it's well above the 95 to 1.1. So this, this potassium excess is knocked out 60% of the yield, but even the greater effect is the chloride. So uh, it's punishment if you are losing yields to apply an expensive fertilizer. And uh, this needs to be corrected before any of these other things will make a difference in your, your yield. It gives you a way to prioritize uh, what's happening. Uh, one grower uh, has... Uh, several sites that he's run through, we've run through the uh, decision support tool process. And in this case, we have a grower that uh, is analyzing for sulfur. And you can see this is the major limiting element, uh, which is responsible for a 28% yield reduction here, a, a 37%, across the board, typically about 30 to 40%, and mostly related to sulfur. Manganese, um, Again, I wouldn't put as much emphasis on manganese. I think uh, given that broad curve and the broad range, uh, we're still working out whether this is uh, critical or not, but it does suggest that manganese uh, could be elevated and it certainly wouldn't hurt anything to put manganese on. Often it's available as a trace element mixture with iron and zinc. So uh, take care of the manganese and uh, don't worry about it anymore, any longer. But you also see that we have uh, these potassium excesses that are occurring. And this needs to be taken care of before you'll get responses to zinc and iron and these others. Now, the elements that are managed here that are shown in green, these are great. Uh, growers doing a really excellent job across the board, but it looks like they need a sulfur burner. And that would bring up the sulfur levels, the manganese, the copper, and the iron all in one solution. And calcium, uh, uh, sulfur burner would bring up calcium by dissolving calcium carbonate, and then you get a free charge of calcium. And the gypsum, which helps the, the soil and uh, displaces sodium and all kinds of great effects on aggregation and uh, soil drainage. So this, this is, uh, shows the power of the tool for prioritizing your nutrient deficiencies and excess problems. Now, lastly, I wanna end on, we were trying to apply artificial neural networks and machine learning to these data sets. And there's some real opportunities here in the future, but for where we ended up, uh, the, uh, we felt that the types of regressions that we were doing, quantile regressions and curve fitting were giving us a more ro robust answer. But what does the computer see? And in this technique, which is called a component self-organizing map, it takes all these different apples and oranges here, yield, nitrogen, all these things, and clusters them. How do they all uh, segregate out if you look at the, the regression model for this? <clears throat> so here it is. Let's take an example here with uh, the yield. So the yields are from 6.5 up to 129 kilograms, bright red being 129 kilograms. This being trees that are uh, not producing down here in blue, and yellow is intermediate. All the computer has readily recognized that all the high yielding trees are segregated into this corner. Now, what's associated with that? We come over here and you see it's all intermediate levels of nitrogen. Up here where we have red going up to 3.2%, all this area, the, any data point that's up in this range has got a low yield. Too much nitrogen suppresses yield. 
What about phosphorus? Too much phosphorus out here. Uh, you see all these high levels. See this faint level here, it's sort of this bluish green yellow. Computer tells us that uh, the low levels of phosphorus are actually associated with higher yields. Potassium. Now we're going from 0.81 to 1.98. It's segregated all the high levels of potassium over on this side. And you see, if we look back at this kilograms, that that's associated with the lowest possible yields. So too much potassium, low yields. Very low potassium, kind of this faint pattern right in here about 0.9, 0.8. This is all good for supporting yields. Calcium, we need more of it. We have low calcium, it doesn't work. Magnesium, uh, a little bit more variable. Zinc, too much zinc, it all ends up in this corner. We've got a few trees that are intermediate in production, but by far uh, most of these trees that are associated over here with high zinc levels have low yields. Manganese, general trend, it seems to be very broadly variable. And iron intermediate, copper intermediate levels, too much copper, low yield. Um, boron, you don't want too much boron. There's a little bit of response here we see, but um, the vast majority of these trees are on the lower side, around uh, 20 to uh, the 30 parts per million of boron. Uh, sodium, um, similar, we have a lot of variation. Sodium in my book is really not a problem at all. It's, it's almost always on the low side. But let's look at the last one here, chloride. Um, here you see the high chloride levels getting up here at 0.88% with um, this red color. And down here where we have blue to yellow, we're down here at, at 0.1 to 0.3%. And this is where all our yields are associated with, uh, with chloride. So um, I show that here, wherever you have high chloride levels, uh, we end up with um, uh, lower levels of phosphorus, nitrogen, but the yield is what we're most, mostly interested in pointing out here. And we tried this as well with uh, alternate bearing. You can look at on off trees. Um, uh, the data set was not as robust with that, but it did show that there was a pattern between particular nutrients and uh, with alternate bearing as well. So the computer sees pretty much what we see looking at the data in this uh, using uh, mathematical and statistical methods. The machine learning methods also are very powerful and almost certainly have a future for uh, optimizing everything in terms of where we need to be for each of our elements. And it also has the power of bringing in other things, uh, management factors as well. So this technique I hope will be exploited in the future further. So to summarize, uh, nitrogen is the most dynamic of the elements, it's continually lost. It's best applied in the spring and early summer with multiple applications. Fertigation would be the best. You want to match tree phenology and in demand. It seems the most critical period uh, is in the early summer, June, July. And uh, empirical field studies, uh, 40 to 125 pounds, really 40 pounds. And I think uh, if you're looking at cutting your fertilizer bill this year and your nitrogen levels in the tree are not less than 2%, uh, you can apply 40 pounds and, and be fine with uh, your crop. If you're getting down to the very low levels, 1.9%, then you might need to go a little bit more. But use your leaf analysis data to guide that. And, and certainly, um, the nitrogen use efficiency that we're getting out here at 125 or 300 pounds of nitrogen per acre per year uh, is, is pitiful. Uh, in fact, it might even eventually be against the law because uh, it results in a large amount of nitrogen going into the, the groundwater. The leaf tissue analysis and soil reports, uh, they guide your fertilization. Uh, many of the concentrations that we see uh, that are on the low end will support rapid tree growth and take canopy development but they're different from those that are associated with the high fruit yields. You're growing a canopy instead of fruit. And I think, you know, when you see your, your data report and you say, okay, it's, it's, a, it's a little bit high, uh, you know, that's not money in the bank, that's actually costing you. So excess nutrients are associated with lower yield potentials and several elements are out of alignment. We have uh, excesses of potassium, uh, possibly of zinc, uh, but we also see where, um, we have deficiencies of calcium, magnesium, and certainly sulfur needs to be brought to attention and uh, included in more uh, data analysis reports. I think it's critical. Certainly you can take out sodium. It's not an issue, uh, 
uh, ask for specifically that sulfur be included. And um, I think uh, some of the things that we'll be getting into in the, in the next uh, talks on uh, irrigation, you know, fertilizer placement, fertigation, uh, all those are, are really critical. Uh, leaching, you have to integrate this with your fertilizer application program so you're not leaching out your nutrients. And uh, you've got to keep the chloride toxicity down so that you can have good root growth. And everything you do to support mycorrhizae and uh, abundant uh, soil life uh, will improve decomposition, internal nutrient cycling, and, and crop uptake. And we have now a variety of methods. These regression methods reveal a statistical comp confidence to the optimal levels. And we've developed decision support tools. And uh, it ranks all these elements. Uh, the information is in the public domain, but uh, if you want us to go through it and apply the equations, provide a custom report, then uh, please go to uh, iwantogrow.com. And uh, I will give one disclaimer. Many things, I've given you some data that is in kilograms uh, per tree at certain levels, uh, but uh, many things will affect your yield. So uh, having good climate, pollination, uh, good management practices, use of mulches, disease control, uh, salinity control, all these things will affect your yield. But if you're targeting getting the yield potentials for your tree with respect to nut tree nutrition, you now have the tools that you can use to guide that and set, get that problem out of the way. So uh, <clears throat> I'll, I'll leave it there. Uh, with thanks to uh, many of the people who, who uh, contributed to this work, Jonathan Dixon was very encouraging, Tim Spann, the great manager for us. Daryl Nelson provided uh, free leaf analysis for us for the entire study. It was a tremendous resource. And then we had a great team at uh, UCR with uh, postdoc Salvatore Campisi, my assistant, Stephen Kui, and uh, Philip, Philippe Rolshausen, Carol Lovett, Tuan Hong, who did uh, all the data uh, reduction for Carol's group. And Mary Lou's been a, a mentor and, and a guide for us as well. So. Uh, and then lastly, the avocado growers. We couldn't have done this without the uh, dozen or so uh, avocado growers that helped us and participated in our study. So Mary Lou, I'll, I'll leave it there and I'll return it to you. Thank you, Dave. That was uh, wonderful.